It's great that you're all showing up in large numbers because this is going to be one of the great panels we're going to hear. You can't hear back there. Can we get some volume? OK, is this better? Can you all hear back there? I can't hear. Not so great. A bit more volume, a bit more this or that. I'll keep trying to talk so that you could set. I think the tradition is to count. There it is. OK, can we, do we have volume? Do we have sufficient? <laughs> Can't tell. Okay. Is this better? No. Can, can, yeah, I'm trying to talk and nothing's happening. <laughs> okay. Yes, now we can hear. So I'll have to carry this around. Um, yeah, welcome. I hope you all had a strong cup of coffee because we're going to have a very strong panel. And uh, we're going to be talking about the generation gap and many other gaps. And so obviously, I'm the last person who should be moderating this because I'm on the other side of every gap. But um, in this case, we're talking about generations and how they became involved. And um, I had my political baptism in the flower power of the 60s, so I'm entitled to a bit of nostalgia, and this will be fun. Now, we have two students with us from the Global Liberal Arts Alliance. They were with us last year. They sent, there you go. They sent, uh, they were with us last year, and uh, we're very happy that they and the cheering section here are with us again this year. Um, we have Regini Nunjaluri from India, Sabrina Harris from the United States, and with them we have two grown-ups. Now, uh, Tuli Madansela has had a remarkable career in South Africa. She's really one of the heroes of the um, last 20 years. She helped draft the Constitution, and for many years she was public protector, and in that capacity she wrote a critical report about state capture, which in South Africa means an attempt by private enterprise to seize control of the government. That report was critical in bringing down the Zuma government. So that is really an example of activism. And uh, Radek Sikorsky likewise played a major part in building democracy, in his case, in early uh, liberal governments of post-communist Poland, uh, which he served as defense and foreign minister and in many other capacities. And um, he hasn't quite finished the job, and I hope you'll go there and continue at some point. Now, um, talking of gaps is very common in any discussion of government or governance. Here we obviously have a sound gap, but we'll try to work with that. And um, there seems to be very often a sense among us older folk that the younger generation students are not involved somehow because I suppose we expect them to be involved in the way we were involved. We expect to see the same kind of activism. And our cliche is that they're sitting all day on their little phones doing things that we have no ideas about. So let me start with our students and ask you, is that true? Are you uninvolved? Do you not care at all about the world and how to govern it? So give us help. Well, firstly, I'd love to thank the Times, the Global Liberal Arts Alliance, and the American College of Greece, along with my very strong support network at the College of Worcester for allowing me to be here today. But Serge, to answer your question, uh, no, that's not true. Um, I have the luxury of attending a liberal arts institution, which was ranked as one of the most politically engaged schools in the country. And I think that even though kids are engaging in a way that they weren't previously, 
um, in a way that is different from your generation, that doesn't mean they're not engaging. And so the cliche is that you see the, these kids on their phones, they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook. That's a way for us to share information. It's a way for us to be galvanized, to be catalyzed by political movements, and to really get to know the human side of the issue. And I think by portraying you know, students as maybe uninvolved or um, unintelligent, it's really damaging because it furthers this notion that they have no reason to be involved. And so I think that we should be changing the narrative to encourage young people to engage politically in whatever form that takes. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, first off, again, thank you so much for this opportunity. But no, I also don't think it's a fair assessment that the youth does not engage. I think that it's a very nuanced narrative across the world. But the youth have been at the forefront of some of the most pivotal um, social movements in recent times. Um, where I come from, we've had some significant social movements that have been championed by the youth. It's been the youth who've started the conversation about gender rights in India. And I think that the manner in which we go about it is definitely very different, perhaps not always the most sustained forms of engagement, um, but it does happen. And um, social media has played a huge role in galvanizing support for a lot of this. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have the ability to get the message across in conventional ways, so we resort to what we have. Yeah, uh, I must say that in preliminary discussions before we came here, I got the sense that both of these students took a break from demonstrating to join us. <laughs> and so it's excellent that you could do that. Uh, Tuli, you have, as we listed before, a wonderful list of credits. You've worked a lot for change in your country. So when you listen to these young women, when you listen to other uh, students in your own country, do you hear yourself a few years back? Is this could they be doing something in South Africa right now or elsewhere in the world? What would you be doing if you were a part of their generation now? Well, firstly, and well, thank you for the privilege. Uh, I would like to agree with um, both Sabrina and Regini that young people need to be encouraged. However, I don't think they need to be given permission. In South Africa, where the history of young people not wanting to wait for permission. From Steve Beaker, who wrote, I write what I like, and, and, and started the black consciousness movement in South Africa, to the Mandelas, who were young lawyers, George Bezos, who comes from this country, and uh, they, they didn't ask for anyone's permission to correct what they thought was wrong, but later, um, in other parts of this world, there are young people who are going beyond even just complaining, beyond social movements, and stepping in and, and actually becoming politicians. Mm -hmm. Well, Radek, let me ask you then. Um, you have had a life of rebellion as a student. I guess you organized things during the solidarity of the early years. Then you were uh, in exile. You were all over the place. Um, that was a revolutionary time that you grew up in. Do you, do you have a feeling that maybe we are living in a similar kind of era? Is it easier to get to become mobilized, to become activated when all hell is breaking loose around you? And well, is this such a time? Until recently, I was concerned that my sons, who are um, 18 and 20, would have nothing to fight for and it would be boring for them. I, th I bought into the uh, end of history narrative. You know, liberal democracy and capitalism have won. The optimum um, way of organizing a modern society is now established. There are some loose ends, but basically we can now, we've created a, an agreeable club and we can now enjoy the facilities. So we've reached a kind of communist nirvana whereby you know, material needs are pretty much satisfied and people can tend the garden in the, in the morning and <laughs> write an opera in the afternoon, right? Well, this, um, this has changed in Poland where um, it turns out that people are not satisfied with um, prosperity and they want collective excitements in the form of discredited old ideas nativist, nationalist, populist emotions. And 
That's why we have a challenge to democracy and therefore something to fight for again. Well, that's good. And that's what I'd like to ask the two of you now. You've been here for a couple of days listening to all this talk of the end of democracy, the end of the world, the end of journalism, the end of everything. I'm exaggerating. It's been very promising and hopeful, really. But do you get a sense that, that there is something that you really need to do now, that you really better get out there fast and before we mess it all up for you? I don't think you were messing it up singularly. I think there have been a, new, a number of factors that have contributed to the place that we find ourselves now. Um, we had the luxury of having our formative years in I guess what you could call a Fukuyama-esque world, where we were living in the understanding of the end of, democ or the end of history. Uh, there seemed to be stable democracies all over the world, but that quickly seemed to disintegrate. And so there are a number of issues facing our generation that are going to have much more intense and much more long-lasting effects than there are older people. Climate change gender dynamics, um, political rights for marginalized groups. These are all things that I think each and every one of us in this room has aimed to work on, yet I don't think that we've achieved the progress that we want. And so the onus of that is falling on my generation. And so working to integrate all sorts of identity groups into politics is one of the most important things that we can do right now. Um, but I think the clock is ticking most intensely with regards to the climate. I think that we need to take sustainable action now, whether that be through the form of the sustainable development goals or through domestic action. Something needs to be done, and that's really falling on us. Mm -hmm. Great. I think, to be entirely honest, there is no shortage of things to um, be revolutionized about. There's lots that's happening in the world that's a cause for grave concern. And I think, um, to a lot of us, we're becoming first-time voters between um, last elections and the next elections, and we're entering for the first time as voters, a highly divisive, highly politicized, um, angry political world. So I think that um, we, it is a conversation that's starting younger and younger amongst us. And that there are a lot of issues that, that we want to talk about. But also, it's, I, I, my issue is greater that within the youth, we are highly stratified. And there is a clear difference in how privilege impacts us and does not. And the greater challenge is how do you ensure that um, Mobilization happens across the spectrum of, of privilege, and that's, that's our greatest challenge, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Listen, let me then ask the two of you to pose the next questions to these two. Okay? Do you have something you want to ask them? And then we'll go the other way around. Okay, so fair, why don't fair you enough. Um, so there are two researchers out of Harvard that have recently completed a book, How Democracies Die, Levitsky and Zablod. And in the text, they identify two main ways that we can keep autocracy from infecting democracy. And those are gatekeepers and guardrails. So essentially things that can prevent, democ or prevent autocracy from infecting democracy um, in an institutional sense, these formalized barriers. And then normative ways within democracy um, that we attempt to integrate democratic norms. We attempt to make things as uh, normalized as possible in terms of giving the people a voice, respecting institutions, and honoring checks and balances. And so I'd be curious what to youth to think of where those two different concepts have failed to land us in the situation that we're in now in terms of the global rise of populism, nationalism, nativism, and the tendency for electorates to lean towards strongmen leaders. Well, thank you, Sabrina. I personally think that those two concepts don't capture what fully what has failed. I, I, I really just think that um, uh, in response also to my colleague uh, Radek, the left left the poor and political entrepreneurs found the poor. Uh, giving people a voice when they're hungry is not enough. I think we have allowed inequality to grow so exponentially that some people are off the grid. Um, and what happens is your political entrepreneurs, they expose ideas of nationalism, quick solutions, sim simple solutions. But one thing they do well is they see poor people, they mm. hear poor people, they articulate their views. So for me, if we are going to make democracy work, if we are going to save democracy from itself, we need to adapt it to our time. I don't think Aristotle, Plato, and all of those philosophers regurgitated 
what their predecessors had said, I think they adapted concepts to suit the challenges of their time, and I think we need to do the same, and you guys should lead that charge. Mm -hmm. Do you want to pitch I in on this? I two minds you? about this, because on the one hand, I agree with you that for democracy to be stable, uh, a sufficient proportion in any society has to feel invested in the system. And, and I also agree that uh, discrepancies in wealth have become too big. That the, um, the, 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 the distribution of respect and of material rewards in society is out of whack. You know, uh, Wall Street financiers may be more useful than doctors, but, but maybe not a thousand times uh, as useful as doctors. And um, we have not updated our tax systems to cover global corporations. We have allowed the rich to squirrel away uh, their ill-gotten gains in, in these tax havens and in these anonymous companies, and this needs to be sorted out. But on the other hand, um, in Poland, we have a major challenge to democracy at a time when Poland is doing economically, is having its best time in our thousand year history. In the last 30 years, we have caught up with the living standards of Western Europe at the fastest rate ever. Uh, we started with a GDP per capita at 30%, mm -hmm. and it's now close to 70%. Uh, and growth is still good. We have not had a single year of recession in the last 25, 27 years, and yet populists were able to make the argument that everything is going to, uh, to the dogs. Mm. Now, mm. therefore, I think the problem is deeper than just this Marxist base economic base determining the ideological superstructure. The problem, I think, is anthropological. Namely, the Homo sapiens is only half rational. The other half needs these excitements, uh, communal excitements. And demagogues, political entrepreneurs, uh, exploit this irrational side of us. You know, George Orwell, in his review of um, Chancellor Hitler's Mein Kampf pointed to this problem, that liberal values are good about sanitation, establishing uh, a framework in which people can seek their own uh, individual happiness. But then there is the flags and, uh, and, um, and uh, identities and, mm. uh, and all that stuff and it always trumps liberalism, because those are stronger emotions. Yeah. And this is what we actually in this room have a problem with, well, that liberal that's... values are tepid, and, and authoritarian nativist values are well, let, let me ask, though, I think I, have I you do heard agree. an answer here? I, I do agree with you that there is an accessibility gap between liberalism and nativism. I think mm. that when we attempt to explain liberal theories, liberal values to people, it's in the form of read this very long, in-depth literature, whereas the right is more than happy to hand out these very simple pamphlets that say, here's who we like, here's who we don't like. If you want 10 more, come ask me. Yeah, here's your enemy. Yes, exactly. But the problem then becomes, how do we make liberalism more accessible? I mean, we can talk about the problem all day. We need to look towards solutions. This is a short-term issue. And so my question is, do we start in the educational system? Do we start by changing norms? In your experience, how can we address this best? Well, we're going to leave this here and let okay. Ragini now give her question and see what we can get a similarly hot debate going here. I think it's actually very connected to this. I think if someone were to ask me what I believe the most credible danger to democracy in today, it's the fact that we think only in terms of identity politics. We vote only as collective identities, whether it's our caste or our race or our ethnicity. And what ends up happening is that it holds policy ransom to these collective identities and their whims and fancies. Um, India's entire welfare development is tied down to who's voting when. And in I mean, in retrospect now, do you th where do you think we went wrong? What turned this conversation into identity and identity alone? And more importantly, where do we go from here as first-time voters? 
What is your advice to someone who is fighting a family that wants them to vote in one direction because of history and culture and legacy, and at the same time, weigh that with what, as youth, we f believe we need? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, Go ahead. Just to respond to both um, Sar um, Ragini and Radek, I, I was a, a political activist from my mid-teens, from the age of about 15 or not, uh, 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 onwards. And it was always about creating a better world, a more just world. And, but what has happened, I would like to admit that when democracy came, we pushed for a better world for everyone, but we treated people as statistics. And I'm worried that you write that things may have been getting better in Poland. They were doing the same in South Africa. But people are not statistics. When you're doing GDP and you're saying, on average, this is how you're doing, there might be a village, there might be a group that is getting nothing of that. That's why people are thinking that we should do both GDP and, uh, and human wellness index, something like that. Uh, because I do believe that political entrepreneurs would not have any followership if life was good. Nobody wants to go extreme when things are working for them. I wish I was so optimistic. <laughs> well, this is my experience in South Africa, that uh, people follow the, um, the extremists mm -hmm. because the status quo is not working for them. But Sabrina, you also provided partial answer is education is equally important because democracy literacy helps people to understand how the system works and how can they change it? But secondly, why some of the solutions that are offered by the extremists are not really solutions? Mm -hmm. Do you have a follow-up or a reaction? I think, I think it's a little more complicated in, from the context that I come from. I think that, um, that we have seen the youth definitely more engaged in activities of the extreme than in the middle path of liberalism as we like to believe it is. But the lines between what is and is not liberal are not as sharp as we seem to think they are. I think that a lot of times we, we are engaged, we are mobilized about issues, about individual things that we see in society. It might be a, a question of gender. It might be a single rape case that brings an entire country together. But the question is where we go from there. And I think there's a, there's a failure for institutions as a whole to reach out to us to make this an easier transition for us to make, because the onus should not be on us. Um, I think it's in the interest of democracies, it's in the interest of institutions to invest in their youth, to keep themselves going. And consistently, I, I think that there is a failure in, in them attempting to reach out more to us. Um, we see politics as a last resort. If all else fails, we will perhaps attempt to run for office. And that shouldn't be the case, and I think that that's where I'd start. Great. Who has a question, a comment, a thought? Thank you. See. Um, I'm Katie Kingsbury from the New York Times. I'm actually Serge's boss. Uh, so we have a generation gap on a regular basis. Uh, I wanted to ask, what I see is a crisis of leadership in a lot of ways, particularly leaders who are trying to resonate with younger people. And so for the students on the panel, who are the leaders that you think could bring us out of this political dark age? You know, I'm, uh, I think a lot of people think that crisis of leadership is because we have demagogues. I actually think it's often because we don't have voices on the other side offering solutions that people see in their daily lives and couldn't better their daily lives. So I'm curious to hear who you look up to, who you think are the future leaders in uh, our country, or in the United States, but also the world? Oh, well, that's a really wonderful question. Thank you so much for asking. Um, I think part of the disenchantment you see today with youth and democracy is the idea that for the US context, in a majoritarian system, many youth feel that neither party best represents their interests. And so as the Overton window starts to shift, and we see the emergence of more extreme policies being proposed on both the left and the right, neither centrist youth have no place to go, essentially. Um, 
personally, I find a lot of inspiration in Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her uh, platform in New York. Uh, additionally, Abby Finkenauer running in Iowa. These are both really young, smart, empowered, impassioned women that are trying to be the change that they want to see. Um, for so long, there have been issues of access in terms of who has the ability to run for office, who has the resources, who has the connections. But I think as we try and shift away from that and understand the value of integrating these different identities into our political system, we need to start to break down those barriers to access. And so I think that's one thing that needs to be done. And then another would be to really examine where youth are on party platforms and how we can best adjust those platforms to give young people the future that they want to see. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I also think that a lot of these, these heroes and these leaders that we look up to don't actually come from the political space anymore. They are people in, in journalism, in, in, uh, in the arts, uh, actors, directors, people from across the board who talk about these issues because it's, they are not issues that are exclusive to those in politics. They are issues that are universal in their impact. So um, the idea that, that someone has to be young to be appeal to the youth or has to be uh, cool to appeal to the youth is, I think, uh, not fair because a lot of our heroes might just be old men. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Julie. I'm going to differ a little bit from our very articulate young um, leaders here. You write that the system should give space. I, I think they write that the, the system should give space to them. But power is rarely conceded without a demand and a push. Throughout history, when women wanted the vote, they needed to demand and push for it. Of course, they needed then to make sure that they got, ally, they got allies from the side of men, and that's where you got people like John Stuart Mill and, and others. When it came to South Africa, the same thing when black people wanted to be included in, in, in the power that's about determining the, the status and future of our country, we needed a demand and a push. Yes, you need allies from the other side. All I'm saying is that we're going to wait for a long time if young people are going to be seeking for permission and seeking to be empowered. I think that the solution is young people demanding their space there and, and, and grabbing some of it. I, I do know that there are some constitutions that reserve some seats for young people, for example, Rwanda, but that's going to come in a long time. And one of the things is about really um, re-engineering democracy. Democracy mm. was not always about political parties. It's more recent that we have political parties. And young people could insist that constitutions should allow other forms of representation beyond political parties and beyond individuals because, yes, you can get independent candidates, but it's expensive. But look at some of the young people in America. They're getting in there without permission. Mm. Indeed, listen, we are very close. We have run out of time, Roddick, ah. but I do, we'll give you the last word. Well, I worry that the Chinese are developing a system which will uh, allow the leaders to do what people want by, through monitoring social media without representative democracy. Uh, artificial intelligence is now making it possible. And I'm actually look, uh, fascinated by the contest between China and India and which uh, model will prevail in, in the long term. But in answer to the question, um, I think in Western societies, leadership is becoming impossible because um, there are basically two types of politicians. One that, are, that you media hold up to the highest standards and the, the lives of those politicians are hell because they they are destroyed for the tiniest uh, transgression. A and then there are scumbags, and they can get away with anything. And you know what I mean. Uh, and therefore, uh, and most of the politicians that you would admire from world history or your country's history would today be destroyed under the first model. Mm. Um, so I think we have a problem. Mm. Well, I want to just disagree and say, leadership is not dead. You're going to get in there and, and grab for it. I'm also convinced there is no generation gap. There is simply a passing of the... Yeah, I see the hands. I'm sorry. 
I, uh, there is a passing of the baton, and, and uh, we are doing that, and I feel far, far more optimistic than I did 30 minutes ago. So again, I apologize that we've run out of time, and now for something completely different, I will invite Roger Cohen to the stage. Thank you very, very much.